recording this event, please stay on mute. You may type a question in the chat box and we'll address it during or at the end of the presentation. And we'll also open the floor at the end so that you can unmute your mic and ask your questions then. And now for our speaker, Dr. Kayla Zorn is a vascular surgeon of the Franciscan Health Heart Center. She earned her medical degree from Indiana University School of Medicine and completed her residency in general surgery at Tulane University of Medicine in New Orleans and her fellowship in vascular surgery at Loyola University in Maywood, Illinois. Dr. Zorn is board certified in general and vascular surgery with special interest in peripheral arterial disease, aneurysms, and carotid artery disease. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Zorn. Hi, thanks for having me, everybody. Um, we had some mic issues, so I'm going to be holding this dragon um, during the talk so that you guys can hear me. Um, but just let me know um, if you have any issues. Um, hold on. So first check. I feel like I'm out of practice with the um, Teams meetings now also. Can everybody see my slides OK? They're fine, yes. yes. OK, yes, perfect. Awesome, OK. Um, so please feel free to interrupt at any time if you have questions. Um, I'll try to, we're going to go through th four different topics, and I'll try to leave some space at the end of each topic. Um, I don't have any disclosures. I just wanted to take a second to actually promote our newest um, partner, Dr. Neil Ramchandani. He just started a couple weeks ago. He um, graduated fellowship from IU, and he's joined the team along with myself. Um, uh, Dr. Keel and Dr. Webb. Um, so if you guys ever have questions, we're the four that you're looking for for vascular disease. So the goal of this talk is to go over common vascular diseases, um, review workup and management and kind of what you can do before you send them um, to a vascular surgeon, and then also be able to identify um, the urgency of um, the referral. So if they need to go to the emergency department or if it's more of a routine referral. So first thing we'll talk about is chronic vascular disease. Um, I have two cases to kind of discuss. Um, so first is a 68-year-old male, history of tobacco abuse, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, who presented to your clinic with right leg pain. He reports that the pain has lasted for about six months and it's progressively worsened. Um, it happens after he walks one block and is relieved by rest. He has palpable femoral pulses. Um, you can't feel any pulses in his feet. Um, and he has no wounds that you can appreciate. Um, you got a duplex ultrasound to look for peripheral vascular disease and noted that he had right SFA occlusion. Um, and the question is, how quickly does this patient need to be evaluated by a vascular surgeon? Second case um, is kind of two parts. So you have a 74-year-old female who has diabetes, CKD, um, coronary artery disease who presents for a routine visit with no complaints. Um, but on your exam, you notice that she has this ulceration right here. Um, you notice that she doesn't have any palpable pedal pulses. So what is the appropriate workup for this patient? And then instead of that wound, instead you see that she has this ulceration um, here on her ankle. Um, so the question is, you know, what would be um, the appropriate next step in this situation. Um, she has enlarged veins, palpable pedal pulses in this situation. So peripheral artery disease, um, it's chronic atherosclerotic occlusive disease of your lower extremities. It's a major global health problem. Um, I actually used a textbook that's a couple years old, and at that time it said more than 200 million people were currently affected by PAD worldwide. Um, and a lot of these patients actually, um, we detect the PAD on non-invasive imaging. They don't have any symptoms. Risk factors, you're going to notice a common theme during my discussion. Um, age, hypertension, metabolic syndrome, dyslipidemia, tobacco abuse, um, diabetes. There's also a risk of inflammation. Um, um, so inflammation and homocysteine are kind of like uh, not as uh, high a correlation of risk factors, but there has been some studies that have shown that patients are at increased risk for peripheral artery disease. Um, the interesting thing with elevated homocysteine levels is that they haven't found that folate supplementation helps with the progression of the disease. Um, and then another risk factor that's 
sometimes skipped over is socioeconomic status, um, which I know that based on the patients I'm seeing um, in the Franciscan system, I know that you guys are also seeing the same patients. Um, so we have kind of a wide range of, of places that um, people come from. Um, of these, age is the strongest risk factor. So people who are older than 80 years old have about a 25% um, chance of having peripheral artery disease. Whenever we look at peripheral artery disease, um, we kind of consider it um, based on the anatomic distribution. Um, so you have aortoiliac disease and then femoropopatial, so from the groin to the knee, and then below the knee is your tibiopetal disease. Um, this can be clinically useful when you're trying to figure out where the problem is. Um, and oftentimes risk there are certain risk factors that will be associated with um, different disease patterns. So those who are smokers are more often going to have large, larger vessel disease, so aortoiliac and femoropopatial disease, whereas in those who have diabetes and chronic kidney disease, uh, more often the tibial vessels are affected. Um, and when it comes to kind of disease segments um, or the anatomic distribution, um, Claudicants, which we'll get into here shortly, um, typically will have like a single segment that's affected. And usually it's either aortoiliac or femoropopatial. Those who have the tibial disease will usually not get claudication and they're going to present a little bit later um, with symptoms. Um, typically in patients who have critical limb ischemia, they're going to have two segments involved or really severe tibial per tibioperineal disease. Um, so when it comes to um, peripheral artery disease, I always talk to patients um, in regards to their kind of clinical complaints, and I split it into four categories, the first of which is asymptomatic peripheral artery disease. Um, its diagnosis is really important um, in order to uh, treat um, their, cardi their cardiovascular risk factors. Um, so these patients have a 2.7-fold greater risk in mortality, and a 5.6-fold greater risk of coronary artery disease-related death. Um, in this category, it's estimated that about 7% of the patients will progress to intermittent claudication over a five-year period. So a lot of these patients, especially if you catch them early, um, may never actually develop symptomatic peripheral artery disease, but it's a good marker to know um, that they're at a higher risk for um, cardio cardiovascular mortality. The second category I talk to patients about is intermittent claudication. Um, so this is reproducible pain brought on by exercise and relieved by rest. I think leg pain is really hard sometimes to figure out if it's a vascular problem or not, but patients who have claudication, it's pretty regular. They'll be able to tell you a certain distance that they walk, um, you know, whether it's to the mailbox or um, if they walk a block, like they'll get pain that stops um, when they rest. Um, other potential causes for pain could be neurogenic, venous, uh, joint pain, or musculoskeletal disorders. Um, and a lot of times I'll actually see patients who uh, may have been told they have sciatica or some sort of nerve pain. Um, and finally, they have their pulses checked and somebody noticed that they didn't have good pulses. And that's what ended up diagnosing them with, you know, an iliac artery occlusion or something like that. Um, so if you have somebody that's coming in with leg pain and you can't really find a good reason for it, consider doing a pulse exam or even getting ABIs um, just to make sure that we're not missing the vascular side of things. Um, when it comes to claudication, their location of pain can be suggestive of what segment um, is involved. So it's usually the segment above where the pain is that's causing problems. So if they're having like butt, hip, or thigh pain, typically they'll have aortoiliac disease. Um, whereas then if they have calf pain, it's more typically femoral popliteal. Um, but this is not um, always the case. So in this category, um, again, it's really imperative that we um, identify these patients more importantly, to reduce the risk of having a cardiac event. Um, in over five years, 20% of these patients will experience a major, a major uh, cardiac event. Um, and in this category, patients, it's really important to know that 
about 70 to 80 percent of these patients are going to um, will not progress to critical limb ischemia, which is the next um, level. Um, most of them will just have claudication. Of those that deteriorate to critical limb ischemia, only about 1% per year will require a major amputation. So the next category, I it's the critical limb threatening ischemia. I always talk to patients, um, I split it into two categories. So you have your rest pain or you have your tissue, uh, your tissue loss. Um, the reason why I kept these together is because critical limb ischemia is really um, the time that we start intervening on patients um, when it comes to vascular disease. There are exceptions to the rule when um, patients have claudication, especially if it's limiting their lifestyle and depending on where the problem is. But that's a major gray zone, whereas in anybody with critical limb threatening ischemia would be considered for a surgery. Um, but it's important to know that it's very broad range of, of hemodynamic compromise. You have anything from rest pain to, you know, um, major um, tissue loss requiring an amputation. Um, but this affects only one to 10 percent of individuals who have peripheral artery disease. So when it comes to staging, um, there's kind of there's two main systems that I'm more comfortable with, but I'm also going to present the Fontaine grade as well. Um, but it's just um, kind of helps um, classify peripheral artery disease um, when it comes to their symptoms and also some objective criteria as well. Um, so looking at the Rutherford category, we'll concentrate on that. Um, they go from mild to severe claudication, and then we have kind of our higher numbers where you have ischemic rest pain, minor tissue loss, and major tissue loss. Um, and you can see over here, which we'll talk about the imaging studies um, here shortly, um, but you'll um, see that they have um, uh, their arterial pressure um, is greater than 50 millimeters of mercury, but at least 20 millimeters lower than resting value. This is for somebody who's um, going to get like a rest and stress ABI. Um, I will explain that in a second. Um, but our ankle brachial indices are a really good objective measure to help us identify um, how severe the peripheral artery disease is, but it's not the only thing. I, I know that I personally lean pretty heavily on the clinical side of things to, uh, to kind of help um, figure out what category they're in and then figure out the best um, um, act, uh, treatment for the patient. When it comes to those who have tissue loss, um, our practice and um, is trying to push to start using the Wi-Fi system um, and documenting it a little bit better just so that we have a more uniform um, documentation um, amongst the patients and also to kind of help um, identify um, risk of um, amputation and also um, the need for revascularization. Um, so the Wi-Fi sco scoring system looks at um, whether or not they have a wound and how bad it is. Um, so you going from zero to three, you either have no wound or you can have a small ulcer, deep ulcer or extensive ulcer. Um, the next thing we look at is ischemia, um, which this is documented by toe pressures, which um, whenever you order an ankle brachial index, you can also get toe pressures um, to help um, um, with your diagnosis. Um, and then finally, a foot infection. Um, so going from zero to three, it's either not infected, mild, moderate, or severe, and kind of gives you definitions for cellulitis or if there's purulence, et cetera. Um, so the Wi-Fi score, once you score each individual um, item, you can go to this table, which is a little bit confusing at first, but um, this one is, the, so there's two different scoring systems. One is risk of amputation at one year, and then also um, likelihood of benefit from revascularization. So for risk of amputation, um, as you go up here for the wound classification, you can see that it's increasing. And then your ischemia, as you go up also, it's increasing from very low to high. And then your foot infection down here would help you find the category. So if you had somebody with, you know, a wound to ischemia one, foot infection one, then they have a, a moderate risk of amputation at one year. 
um, which moderate is stage three, and that's 8.4% per year. So you can see here as we go up in staging for amputation risk right here, um, from stage one, it's less than 1%, and stage four is 25% risk of a major amputation at one year. Um, so that's, we're trying to kind of coordinate um, on our side to help, um, I guess, quantify like the risk of amputation and also um, if they would benefit from revascularization. Same thing down here. So you can tell people who have low scores are not going to benefit much from revascularization, but then as you move up, they'll benefit. Any questions about this so far? It's all the boring stuff. Um, so one thing just to discuss also um, is when it comes to critical limb ischemia, um, being able to recognize arterial versus venous ulcers will be very helpful um, in, in getting them to the correct diagnosis and management. Um, so when it comes to arterial ulcers, um, typically um, they are at sites of trauma. So um, it's like diabetic foot wounds you're gonna see at that plantar um, aspect of the foot or on the tips of the toes as well. Whereas in venous ulcers, um, uh, are usually like around the ankles um, or on the shins. Um, risk factors are different. So we already talked about the risk factors for arterial disease. For those who have venous disease, there's a huge genetic component. So family history puts them at risk. Um, history of DVT, pregnancy, obesity also put them at risk for venous um, ulcerations and venous reflux. Um, with arterial disease, you're going to see potentially either claudication or rest pain that comes with the tissue loss, although it's not all the time, um, especially pa patients who are diabetic, um, may not, you know, may have neuropathy that don't have the pain, um, but they will have, um, you know, uh, pulseless. They will not have um, pulses, um, palpable pulses. They may have Doppler signals. Um, for vein disease, patients are usually going to have this like achy heaviness um, at the end of the day, especially. They may have itching or burning over their varicosities uh, as well. Um, and they're going to have very obvious um, edema if they've gotten to the point where they have a, a venous wound. Um, also, one thing to note for arterial disease is that usually the ulcerations are well defined. I wonder if I can, I'm going to just go back here. So, you can tell here that there's a very clear border. Um, this is our, your arterial wound, uh, punched out almost. Whereas in for our venous wounds here, it's not as clear. You can also see some venous skin changes, your brownie edema, and then the, um, oh man, I can't remember the medical term for this. It's 4B disease, like Corona phlebo phlebotica. Let's see. Um, and then um, as far as evaluation, obviously arterial, you're going to go down the ABI route and the duplex route versus venous. You can actually order a venous reflux study. It's really important to note for venous reflux study, that if, you, if you go and order um, like a lower extremity venous study, there's different reasons why you can order it. There's vein mapping, there's DBT, or there's venous reflux. So just make sure you uh, select the venous reflux to get the right study for the patient. So when it comes to screening for peripheral artery disease, um, I try to include the USPSTF, um, the Society for Vascular Surgery, and the American Heart Association for all of these. Um, just so you can see, there's a little bit of controversy as far as um, who should be screened. So USPSTF does, does recommends against routine screening for patients with peripheral artery disease. Um, the Society for Vascular Surgery recommends it for high-risk individuals. So those who are so older than 70 years old, diabetic, all of the different risk factors that we discussed. Um, American Heart Association actually recommends it for over 65 years old or those who are younger with risk factors or a family history or those who are 50 years old or greater with diabetes plus one additional risk factor. Um, or they also include any individual with um, atherosclerosis in another vascular bed, which I really think uh, um, you know, includes the other risk factors as well. Um, so, I mean, I, I think if, I definitely think if you have patients who have a wound and do not have palpable pulses, I would recommend 
screening them at, at that point. But for patients who um, are asymptomatic, kind of depends on who you ask whether or not the, the screening um, would be appropriate or not. I think I'm biased so that I would say I would screen anybody who is high risk. Um, when it comes to management of peripheral artery disease, um, we want to make sure that we have them on um, medications actually not to reduce their risk of, of peripheral art complications from their peripheral artery disease, but to reduce their cardiovascular mortality. Um, so currently it's recommended that they're on an antiplatelet therapy as well as lipid lowering agent. Um, statins are the first line, but if they have any side effects from the statins, there are many other medications that are available for them. Um, smoking cessation. If anybody has any tips or tricks to help people quit smoking, let me know, because I think it's a conversation I have every day in clinic, um, but that's huge for patients. Um, another thing that's really important for people with peripheral artery disease is actually a walking program. It's most important for those who have intermittent claudication. Um, so the whole goal in the walking program is to get their um, um, muscles to be slightly ischemic, right, so that they're having pain, but that will actually promote collateral um, circulation to form um, and actually could potentially improve their walking distance over time. I'll usually tell patients the goal should be to walk 45 minutes three times a week, but when they're walking, if they have to stop, they have to stop the timer as well. Um, and so I encourage them to actually push through the pain a little bit um, to help with the collateral blood flow. Um, for all of the patients that we talk about, it's going to be really important that we manage their comorbidities as uh, as well. Um, it's, you know, diabetics, chronic kidney disease, all of everything is is tied together. Um, so trying to um, have everything controlled will help reduce the risk of progression of disease. Um, diagnostic studies we're going to talk about on the next slide, um, but those are important to obtain. Then. Depending on what their symptoms are, that will determine um, what the appropriate consultation would be. So in patients who have intermittent claudication, regardless of what their ultrasound shows, if they truly get pain at rest or pain when walking and gets they get better at rest, you can do a routine vascular surgery consult, get them on an aspirin or statin, talk to them about smoking cessation, encourage them to walk, and we, and we can see them, um, you know, in the office when we have an opening. We will end up following these patients annually after that um, just to make sure they're on the correct medications. And we'll, I usually, I, my partners and I are a little bit different in how we follow people, um, but I'll usually get an ABI every year um, just to see um, if anything's changed because that can kind of um, give us a hint as to whether or not their disease is progressing. When it comes to critical limb ischemia, it is um, a very wide range, right, from rust pain to tissue loss. Um, I think that it definitely warrants an urgent vascular surgery consultation um, because these patients now qualify for intervention. Um, if their foot's infected, right, or anything, if there's a foot infection or any concern that would warrant going to the emergency room, that's different. But these are for the patients who may have, you know, a foot wound that you happen to catch um, on your visit that they say has been there for a month um, or somebody who's developed, you know, rest pain and their ABIs suggest that they have uh, peripheral artery disease. So when it comes to um, the diagnostic studies, kind of the three main um, studies that I use to evaluate peripheral artery disease are ankle brachial indices, a duplex ultrasound, and a CT angi um, angiogram. Um, so when it comes to ABIs, um, what we're doing is we're actually measuring the brachial blood pressure in both arms, and then we are uh, measuring the pressure in the um, that it takes to um, lose the signal in the dorsalis pedis and the posterior tibial artery at the ankle. And ABIs are calculated based on the highest arm pressure, regardless of which side, and then the highest arterial pressure between the DP and the PT. Um, so AB, um, the other thing that we do with ABIs is we uh, will look at the Doppler waveforms, which I did not include that in here because um, I didn't want to bore anybody with our ultrasound physics. Um, but we'll look at the Doppler waveforms and we'll also look at pulse volume recordings. So pulse volume recordings are actually measuring the change in volume in the tissue at the level of the ankle. Um, and those can be helpful 
in certain situations. So in diabetics, they typically have calcified vessels. So if you imagine you're trying to compress a calcified vessel, you may get a falsely high um, reading or the vessels could be non-compressible and you will not be able to calculate an ankle brachial index. Um, so by getting all three of those, um, that can be really helpful um, to kind of um, um, decrease the, um, what am I trying to say? It'll help in patients who have calcified vessels um, to, um, my brain is not working right now. It will give you more information so that if the ABIs are falsely elevated or um, incorrect, that you may be able to say, okay, even though this ABI is high, um, they have normal pulse volume recording, so their chance of having peripheral artery disease is much lower. Um, when it comes to ABIs, there there is a range that people report as far as, you know, so normal is above one, um, borderline is above 0.9, and then um, mild to moderate peripheral artery disease is 0.4 or higher, and then severe peripheral artery disease is less than 0.4. I can tell you that I don't use those numbers religiously because it's a combination of the numbers, their you know clinical status, things like that, along with the um, Doppler signals and the pulse volume recordings as well that kind of help me determine what category these patients are in. But it can be a good guide. Um, you know, if you see somebody with a 0.9 ABI and normal Doppler signal and normal pulse volume recordings, then they probably just have mild arterial disease. Um, one thing I wanted to add is in patients who have diabetes um, or chronic kidney disease, they're, they're the ones that are at the highest risk of having um, calcified disease. And so their ankle brachial indices will be falsely elevated. Um, one thing you can do in the comments of the order is you can actually say obtain toe pressures as well. Um, the smaller vessels in your toes are usually not um, often affected by um, calcific disease. And so we may be able to get more information um, regarding the toe pressure in those who have cal calcified vessels in their tibial vessels. Next is duplex ultrasonography. Um, so this is um, a lower extremity arterial duplex. Um, limitations to this, so it's operator dependent. Um, sometimes it can be difficult to assess tandem lesions. So the way that we actually determine um, stenosis based on duplex is based on their velocities. So you have your peak systolic velocity and your end diastolic velocity, which is measured here and here. Um, the other, th we do also look at waveforms and things like that. Um, but if you imagine you have two lesions that are right next to each other, um, you may you may have um, changes in velocities um, that that you may not be able to see um, just because they're so close to each other. Um, also, if you want to evaluate the aortoiliac segment, this can be difficult um, due to overlying bowel gas or even patient body habitus as, as well. Um, so, in patients who are having like buttock claudication or any signs um, that it may be um, aortoiliac disease, um, a, a better test would actually be a CTA. Um, so I included the CTA abdominal aorta bilat femoral runoff. So this is like the exact thing that you type into EPIC to get the order that we need to evaluate um, peripheral artery disease. It, it's not helpful to just get a CTA of the right or left lower extremity because we miss part of the aortoiliac segment. And if we're already going to um, uh, radiate the patient and already going to give them a contrast bolus, by doing the entire abdominal aorta and bilateral lower extremity runoff, that's going to give us all the information we need. Um, so if you do decide to order a CTA for patients, make sure you include the abdominal aorta as well. Um, obvious limitations would be radiation and IV contrast. So anybody who has an allergy or is um, uh, chronic kidney disease um, would be, you know, would, this would not be a good option that, for them. Um, I'm just going to go back here really quick. So when it comes to imaging studies, um, I will tell you that myself and my partners practice a little bit differently. And I think depending on who you go to, they may say you should do X, Y, and Z for patients. 
Um, so I will tell you my personal preference. So in anybody who has peripheral artery disease, you can always start with an ankle brachial index and send them to our clinic and it's not a problem. Um, if the patient has rest pain or tissue loss, they are likely going to need an intervention and I will be ordering more imaging studies um, to evaluate to help me decide, um, you know, what kind of the next step is for them. So I usually recommend if they have critical limb threatening ischemia, I would also get at least a duplex ultrasound of that leg. That's going to, it'll give me some information about the iliacs, um, but also will show me if there's any problems in the lower legs and it will, it'll be a little bit uh, more helpful. It'll be like that extra step so that the patient doesn't, you know, have to potentially get two more imaging studies um, before they have an intervention. So that's kind of my personal preference, but I can tell you that my partners practice differently than I do. So going back to our first case, we have our patient who has our uh, claudication at one block that's relieved by rest. Um, the big thing to point out here is that he has right SFA occlusion. And the most important thing to learn from this case is that when it comes to chronic peripheral artery disease, regardless of what the ultrasound shows, um, the urgency of the matter is based on their symptoms. So in somebody who has intermitt intermittent claudication, there's no urgent need for surgery and they can get a routine vascular surgery um, consult, or they can get a routine vascular surgery consult and come to our clinic. There are patients who have aortic occlusion, right? And you re you still see that on the CAT scan and it sounds absolutely terrifying. Um, but as long as they just have intermittent claudication, there's no um, urgency for intervention. Um, I actually had a patient today who came to my clinic who has right iliac occlusion and we are not, we're just managing her medically. Um, so that's the case for this patient. So aspirin, um, statin, hype, manage the hypertension, smoking cessation. We talked about the walking program and then the routine vascular surgery consults. Um, for case number two, and somebody who presents with a wound. So this is going to be a little bit more urgent, right? That's somebody who has non-palpable pulses um, and tissue loss. So this is going to be somebody um, that fits into the critical limb ischemia category. So my personal preference, which I know, um, like I said, people practice differently, would be to get ABIs and then an ipsilateral lower extremity arterial duplex. It's also important to get them started on the medications as well. Um, and then an urgent vascular surgery consultation would be warranted for this patient. And then just to throw in the comparison to the venous disease, this is the patient who um, would get a venous reflux study. Um, and you, I would refer them to vascular surgery and wound care. We actually have a separate clinic um, at Stone's Crossing that manages our vein work, so um, which I, I did not think to include their phone number. Um, but I can look it at, up and make sure um, that you guys have that information. Um, so that way, if there's um, vein disease, they would actually be better off at that clinic because that's where we do all of our procedures, et cetera. Any questions about chronic um, peripheral vascular disease? Okay, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna try to talk faster. Um, so acute limb ischemia is um, um, a little bit different. Um, so this is largely a clinical diagnosis, and it's really important to have a high index of suspicion in patients like this because if you miss a diagnosis, um, they're at a high risk for amputation. Um, uh, so acute limb ischemia is a sudden change in the arterial supply versus chronic, where it's over time they have time to develop collaterals. Um, if you remember the six P's that come with acute limb ischemia, it's pain, pallor, paralysis, paresthesia, pulselessness, and poikilothermia, or cold limb. There's multiple different sources for acute limb ischemia. They can have anything from atrial fibrillation, um, endocarditis, like sept even they can have septic emboli, um, cardiac tumor. They have a patent PFO or a PFO, um, then um, if they have a DVT, they're at risk for embolic uh, peripheral vascular disease. Um, there's also atheroembolism and aortic uh, mural thrombi that, that can cause this problem. 
And then additionally, there's thrombotic sources. So people who get vasospasm, if they have aortic dissection, if they have a history of bypass that's occluded, et cetera. So when it comes to acute limb ischemia, um, we um, uh, categorize, again, with the Rutherford classification, but it's a little bit different for acute limb ischemia. And this is really um, the most important findings that um, are going to affect the um, need for operative intervention and the timing are going to be your sensory and motor exam. So anytime I hear somebody has a, a, you know, an acute limb, the first thing I want to know is what their sensory and motor function is. Um, so um, the people that we can really affect are these in Rutherford II um, classification um, because these people have started to show signs of ischemia with kind of um, decreased sensation, um, but they're not so far ischemic that they are going to lose function of their leg and actually be at risk for a like reperfusion injury and compartment syndrome if they're revascularized. Um, so you can also, you know, there's you can also check the arterial and venous signals, but really motor and sensory function um, is the most important. Um, very easy. Anybody with acute limb ischemia, you send them to the ER. Um, if you're, I don't know if there's any inpatient providers here, um, but I would obviously do an emergent vascular surgery consult. Um, but in the meantime, I would start a heparin drip um, right away if there's no contraindication. Um, we'll take them to the operating room on a heparin drip, so you don't need to worry about that. And then the CTA um, with bilateral femoral runoff um, would be the study of choice if um, you know, they have a normal creatinine and things like that. Um, if there is any concern to give them contrast, just talk to vascular surgery because we may, you know, decide to take a different approach um, when it comes to acute limb ischemia. Next up, abdominal aortic aneurysms. Um, I'm going to go a little bit faster through some of these slides just so we could get through and I'm not talking over time. Um, but I wanted to point out the word ectasia because you guys will see those in the read sometimes, and I feel like it's not a word that's that's n well known. So, um, ectasia is basically the the middle ground between aneurysmal and normal artery. So, a true aneurysm is 1.5 times the normal diameter of the artery, and then ectasia is kind of that intermediate stage where it's larger than normal, um, but not technically aneurysmal. Um, so when it comes to aneurysms, there's there's um, two teams that you need to think about as far as um, treating aneurysms. Anything in the ascending aorta goes to cardiothoracic surgery. Um, anything in the descending aorta or inferenal aorta will come to vascular surgery. When it comes to aortic arch aneurysms, right now at this institution, um, I don't even, I don't know if we see that many, um, but I, cardio um, cardiothoracic surgery would most likely handle that. There are some new endovascular techniques um, of doing work in the arch that I uh, personally am not doing, um, but I don't know like what the future holds um, as far as aneurysms in the arch. Um, but definitely descending thoracic and abdominal aortic aneurysms, um, we are the ones that you refer to. Excuse me. Um, so risk factors, male, tobacco abuse, family history, atherosclerosis, cardiac disease, and hypertension. Um, when it comes to screening, so USPSTF recommends um, that men ages 65 to 75 who have ever smoked gets a one-time screening, which is your duplex ultrasound. The Society of Vascular Surgery um, recommends one time for men age 65 or greater, regardless of their smoking history, or it also recommends it for first degree relatives of patients with an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And then the American Heart Association recommends, again, one time for men age 65 or older. And then for women um, who are older than 65 with a family history. I know we offer the screening scan here at Franciscan um, and I know, I think, I think patients can get it even younger than 65, um, but that is an option for um, your patients if they're interested in it. As far as repair, so I am talking right now just about the inferenal aortic aneurysms. Those are the most common that we're going to see. Um, so we typically will treat anything that's 5.5 centimeters or greater. Um, in men or five centimeters or greater in women. And then the other thing we look at is whether or not it's expanding rapidly, which can be a sign of infection 
Um, but if it grows more than a centimeter in a year or half a centimeter in six months, that's also an indication for surgery. And then the saccular morphology. So this picture right here shows like this kind of outpouching that looks like that versus fusiform here. Um, there is a concern that these are higher risk for rupture. So we usually um, offer treatment at any size for the saccular aneurysms. So if you see saccular, uh, make sure you refer them to vascular surgery to be evaluated. Um, the reason why we typically treat at five and a half centimeters is because you can see that as the aneurysm um, grows in size, um, there's a much higher risk of rupture at one year. Um, so anything below five centimeters has a 1.5% chance of, of risk of rupture per year. And then it goes to maybe like the 10% category in the five centimeter range. And then over six centimeters, um, uh, 11 to 22 and greater than seven is greater than 30%. Um, so in patients, and it's important to know this because in patients who come to you and have a three centimeter aneurysm, um, their chance of rupturing is is so low. It's um, important to reassure them um, that you know their chance of rupturing is low, and it um, that we will continue following it. Um, the other thing to know that's important is that usually aneurysms grow about two millimeters a year or so. So in somebody who comes in with a three centimeter aneurysm, it's going to take a while for it to reach the criteria where it's at a high risk for rupture and then potentially warrant a surgery. So when it comes to um, aneurysms, um, very similar to our PAD. So we want to minimize cardiovascular events. Right now, um, aspirin 81 millig milligrams is um, um, recommended for them, no statins, um, unless they also have some you know, concurrent peripheral vascular disease. Um, increasing aerobic activity will also help reduce um, cardiovascular events for these patients. Smoking cessation. Um, one thing that these patients want to avoid is anything that requires them to like Valsalva very strongly. Um, so I usually tell them not to lift heavy weights, um, but you know, moderate like aerobic activity is okay. Um, there are some studies that say that fluoroquinones, so like Cipro and Levo, um, can increase the aneurysm size. Um, so I try to avoid um, giving patients these medications if they have a known aneurysm and then manage our comorbidities. Um, so when it comes to surveillance and indications um, for um, repeat ultrasound, anybody who comes in with an aneurysm from three to 3.9 centimeters needs a repeat ultrasound in three years. These patients really do not need to come and see us um, if, if they're uncomfortable. I understand like they may, you know, want to see a vascular surgeon to make sure there's no problem. Um, but the recommendation by the Society of Vascular Surgery is to repeat an ultrasound in three years for these patients. Once they get over four centimeters, I think it's reasonable for them to start seeing a vascular surgeon. Um, you could, I, honestly, for men, I could make the argument that over four and a half is when they would need to come and see us. Um, and for women, four. Um, but for here, just to be simple, I said anyone from four to 4.9 centimeters needs a routine vascular surgery consult, and the SVS recommendations are to repeat the ultrasound in one year. Um, anyone, and these numbers are based on men. A lot of um, studies for aneurysms is based off of men. So for women, I kind of um, translate. So if they're, you know, four point, so if they're within five centimeters of needing repair, I'm going to repeat their ultrasound in six months. For men, it's five to 5.4 centimeters. We'll repeat the ultrasound in six months. Um, and then once they get above the five centimeters, then um, they are going to be evaluated for operative repair. These patients um, who are in the five and a half to six centimeter range are totally fine with a routine vascular surgery consult. We're seeing patients within a month or two anyways. Um, and there's no, uh, as long as they're not having any symptoms, abdominal pain, back pain, et cetera, or, or concern for rupture, then they're safe to come routinely. Um, anyone who's greater than six centimeters, um, that's kind of the cutoff that I use as a higher risk for rupture. So I would recommend just putting in an urgent vascular surgery consult. Um, it's just to get them in, make sure that we have an operative plan. You know, if they need cardiac workup or other things like that, it'll give us a little bit of time um, to get them in and um, uh, in for surgery if they elect to have a procedure. Anybody who's symptomatic, um, so sudden onset abdominal pain, it can radiate to the back. Classically, it's on the left side, like left side of the spine, or, you know, somebody who passes out 
obviously is going to go to the emergency department. Um, I will say, I don't think I've ever seen a rupture less than four and a half centimeters safely. So if you have somebody who has pain like that and an aneurysm of four centimeters or less, then I would look for um, an alternative diagnosis. Any questions about aneurysms? All right, last topic. Um, so carotid stenosis, um, stroke is one of the major causes of mortality um, worldwide. Unfortunately, with vascular surgeons, we have peripheral artery disease, aneurysm, stroke that we're dealing with. Um, so these patients are really sick. 87% um, of strokes in the U.S. are ischemic. Um, and um, cerebrovascular disease is one key preventable cause of ischemic stroke, along with AFib and hypertension. Um, there's a lot of different ways that um, people have like talked about different types of, of stroke. I found this um, TOAST classification, which kind of splits it into cardioembolic, large vessel disease, um, which is about 50% um, of the causes of stroke, small vessel disease, and then these two um, like interesting categories. So unusual causes or undetermined etiology, which interestingly enough, um, you know, quarter to a third of patients who have a stroke um, have an undetermined etiology. When it comes to risk factors, we're seeing a lot of the same things for all of these patients. Um, vascular disease everywhere has the same risk factors. Prior TIA and stroke is a big one, um, along with tobacco abuse. Um, renal insufficiency. Um, men are at a higher risk than women for carotid stenosis, um, similar to our aneurysms, although women account for a higher percentage of mortalities. Um, um, race puts you at a higher risk, um, family history, and decreased physical activity as well. This is just a chart to kind of show um, that um, age is definitely a huge risk factor um, when it comes to um, uh, um, stroke. Uh, yeah, from, for stroke. Um, and then especially um, you can see uh, there's a higher risk. Um, looks backwards. Sorry. But yeah, as you go up, there's a higher risk um, for stroke in these patients. Um, so screening recommendations. USPSTF recommends against screening the general population, um, where the Society of Vascular Surgery recommends that patients who are older than 55 with risk factors, if they're fit for surgery, so if this is somebody who um, is not going to be able to tolerate a procedure, um, then they wouldn't recommend um, screenings uh, since it won't change your management for the patient. And then American Heart Association also recommends against routine screening um, for these patients. Um, so main imaging study that we do for these patients is a carotid duplex ultrasound. Um, so again, just like in our um, uh, lower extremity arterial duplex, our um, stenosis is, is an estimate based on your velocities. So um, those who have a stenosis are going to have a higher velocity. The blood's going to be moving um, faster through that area. Um, and then we also actually look at the ratio um, of velocities from the internal carotid artery to the common carotid artery. So those three numbers kind of um, give us an estimate of the range of stenosis. So you guys will see that um, patient, typically for the ultrasounds, um, you'll see either a range of 0 to 49 percent. You'll see a range of 50 to 69 percent. You'll see greater than 70 percent. And then there's some numbers that will also qualify you for greater than 80 percent. Um, you also can obtain a CTA for these patients of the head, head and neck, um, and that will give you a more specific number. It's based on the NASA criteria, but we're looking at the diameter um, of the stenosis, so the smallest diameter compared to the diameter of the normal internal carotid artery. Management for these patients. Um, so same as our peripheral artery disease. Um, there's a couple more like specific um, uh, goals for these patients, but you want to make sure that they're on antiplatelet therapy, also to reduce their cardiovascular risk factors, managing their um, antihypertensives, managing their diabetes, smoking cessation, um, also statin therapy, um, avoiding excessive alcohol consumption. And then for these patients who are asymptomatic, um, 
there's recommended uh, surveillance imaging. So for those with less than 50% stenosis, but who truly do have stenosis, the recommendation is to repeat an ultrasound in three years. So there will be some that say, or there will be some ultrasounds where there's no plaque, et cetera. Those patients do not have um, carotid stenosis. But for those who may have some you know, plaque uh, buildup, that's recommended that they repeat in three years. Um, for anybody who's greater than 50% stenosis, I recommend a referral to vascular surgery, um, even, even if they're asymptomatic. Um, and this is just because um, we will follow them um, depending on you know, how bad the stenosis is. I may decide that we need to do a CTA um, to see if I believe the ultrasound, um, or I may decide that I want them to follow up in six months or a year. It's kind of a little bit more detailed. Um, so I think that the best thing is if you see somebody who has more than 50% stenosis, just send them over to us so that we can make sure we do the appropriate follow-up. Um, I know that we've all seen signs and symptoms of stroke, but um, just a quick reminder. Um, I will have patients who um, come in and say they're dizzy or have vertigo and things like that. Um, and it's a little bit harder to um, to discern, um, but typically those who are like getting lightheaded or things um, like vertigo are not um, a symptom of stroke. It's more like if you have um, like, you know, d problems with coordination of one arm or one leg or something like that, um, that is a sign of a stroke. Um, further management, oh, sorry, for management for symptomatic carotid disease. So uh, those who are outpatient, um, if you have patients who complain of like a history of a TIA, um, then they will need an urgent referral to vascular surgery. Um, those who have greater than 50% stenosis who are symptomatic um, will actually be, uh, well, there's, a, there's an indication for surgery in that situation. Um, Obviously, if they're having active stroke symptoms, they will be going to the ER. Um, but if you catch somebody in that phase who maybe had a TIA and didn't know what it was and they end up in your clinic, um, then definitely have an urgent referral to vascular surgery. Um, also, make sure that they're on antiplatelet agent, a statin, smoking cessation, all of the other kind of recommendations that, it, um, that come with every vascular disease um, that we've talked about today. Um, the other thing that I think is really important for these patients, especially if they've had a recent TIA, is make sure that they know if they experience those symptoms again, that they need to go to the emergency department. Um, I think a lot of patients, like if it happens and it goes away, um, you know, they think that they're okay. But if they have another TIA, that's just another sign that they have an impending stroke. So it's important that they're evaluated. Um, and and honestly, if they had multiple TIAs, I would admit them to the hospital to operate on them sooner rather than later. So quick summary. Um, when it comes to vascular patients, um, you can you, there's a common theme uh, as far as management. So antiplatelet agents, um, statins, except for those who have um, aneurysms, managing their comorbidities, tobacco cessation, and then and anybody who comes in thinking about the imaging and referral pattern. So for peripheral vascular disease, the clinical um, symptoms are going to tell you how urgent the referral needs to be. So in anybody who just has intermittent claudication, um, they can get a routine vascular surgery consult. And then I would suggest just getting ABIs um, to start, but the vascular surgeon who sees them can kind of decide what is the appropriate imaging study. And any of those patients who have rest pain or tissue loss, which is your critical limb ischemia, they need an urgent referral to vascular surgery to be evaluated for an intervention. And patients who have carotid stenosis, Anybody who's um, asymptomatic but has greater than 50% stenosis needs a routine referral to vascular surgery. Anybody who's symptomatic but greater than 50% stenosis needs an urgent referral and make sure you educate them on signs of stroke and tell them to go to the emergency department if they experience that again. When it comes to aneurysms, um, depending on the size criteria, um, tells you when to repeat the ultrasound. Most important cutoff to know is, so if they're less than four centimeters, so three to 3.9 centimeters, they need a repeat ultrasound in three years and reassurance. Um, if they're more than four centimeters, 
send them over to us. Um, we will plan on getting a repeat ultrasound in one year and we can and we can follow the patients um, and educate them a little bit more. Anybody who's more than five and a half centimeters um, does qualify for surgery, but um, unless they're greater than six, they don't really need an urgent vascular surgery consult. And then anybody who has signs of rupture, I would send them to the emergency department. Um, so I included, this is our office number for um, our 5255 Step 11 office that's right next to the hospital. Um, so this is the number that um, we can we can see vein patients here. So if you can't figure out where to send them, you can send them to this office and we can get them to the right place. Um, but I'll try to get the vein, um, vein clinic information out to you guys somehow. Also, I included my cell phone number here. Please write it down. I'm happy to, uh, to take a phone call if you guys have any questions. Um, I know that vascular disease is really complex um, and sometimes hard to kind of know what the best thing is for the patient. Um, so I'm happy to take a phone call um, if you guys um, need help figuring out kind of how urgent the problem is or um, if you have any questions that I can help you with. Thank you. Dr. Zorn, there's a question in the chat <clears throat> from Dr. Yeah. Lynch. And um, she said, is it, it is said to avoid excessive alcohol with carotid stenosis. Is that just from increased blood pressure or is there some other complication? That is a great question. Um, I will t I will tell you that those risk factors and those recommendations I got from the Rutherford textbook, which is kind of like the Holy Bible for vascular surgery. And I did not look into why um, that was the answer or why that was the recommendation. So if if you do look deeper into that, can you message Dr. Lynch? Yeah. In an email. I will, I will look, I will look deeper into it. Are there any other questions anyone has? We have a couple of minutes left. There's another question just dropped in. It says treating small varicose issues with RF ablation. Good. Is that a good procedure? Um, so when it comes to veins, which I gave a whole hour long talk about these a couple of weeks ago. Um, so typically indications for surgery for venous reflux disease is anybody who has an ulcer um, or so the first the first recommendation is to do compression, elevation, um, increased exercise. Um, and then those who are symptomatic. So like if they have achiness, heaviness, pain at the end of the day that's affecting their daily their daily life or those who have wounds are those um, who are recommended for treatment. And people who have just like small varicose veins, um, but without any other symptoms, it, it's more of a cosmetic issue than anything. And it's not recommended um, that they have a venous ablation. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah, Ectasia. But, Everybody yeah. sees Ectasia and they're like, what is that? So. And like I said, I know I know that vascular surgery is complex and, I, you know, my partners and I all trained at different places at different times. So we all kind of have um, different approaches to things. So if there's any question, I mean, my like I said, my cell phone, I'm available. Um, if please let me know, you can reach out by secure chat. I'm happy to. Um, help you kind of decide the best thing for your patient. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Zorn. Appreciate you sharing your um, knowledge and expertise on this topic. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out. You can email or you can call, you know, text, call Dr. Zorn. But thank you. Don't forget to uh, fill out, complete the evaluation form. I'll put in, I'll put it in the chat when we're at, we're finished here to be able to get your uh, CME for this talk. And so everyone have a nice evening. Thanks a lot.